objectives for Africa to 2063. I do believe that these 40 years will be a remarkable period of progress for Africa. I see 40 years of high economic growth, growing integration across the continent into one uh, strong union, uh, one common market, and one leading voice in the world community. And by the time we reach 2063, Africa will be around 30% of the world population. You're going to be carrying a, a major uh, part of humanity and a major responsibility for humanity as well. And so it's very, very important that these 40 years be a period of success, achievement, tremendous progress, and for our purposes today, achieving sustainable development. So perhaps it's useful to just say first, what does sustainable development mean? Because that is the globally agreed objective. We could define it as the 17 goals in the 2030 agenda, but I want to define it in a more general way. For me, sustainable development means achieving four objectives, all difficult in their own right, even harder to achieve simultaneously, but really defining the future that we want. The first objective is material well-being for everybody, ending poverty. Ending poverty in a world that is a very wealthy world now, in, for which, in my view, there should be no remaining poverty or place for poverty. The world economy measured simply in market prices and US dollar currency is about $100 trillion per year now. That means an average of $12,500 per person on the planet. If we measure by so-called international prices or purchasing power parity, it's much higher than that. Uh, perhaps $150 trillion a year, or almost $20,000 per person at international prices. Why in a world of this prosperity should there be any poverty any place? The answer is there should not be. And if we had uh, the mindset right and the global cooperation right, there would not be poverty. I'm a little annoyed because I said in a book in 2005 called The End of Poverty that extreme poverty could be ended by 2025. The presidents in my country did not read my book well enough. Uh, and um, I continue to give them not quite passing grades because they're not doing their part. They're very interested in wars, not so interested in peace and development. But we could have achieved the end of poverty by 2025 next year, but we won't because we were diverted by many, many wars in the interim between the time that I wrote that book and now. But we can achieve the end of poverty within a short period of time if we have the right focus, policies, and institutions. The second pillar of sustainable development is social inclusion. That all parts of society and all parts of the world are part of that prosperity. Now, the most fundamental change is that it's not just the so-called Western world. And by Western world, that's a kind of strange designation. I don't like calling it the West. I don't like calling it the North or the global North because none of these make sense when you look at a map, but it is basically the North Atlantic world, Britain, the United States, Western Europe that imperialized most of the world for uh, at least two centuries, including Uganda, of course. And prosperity came first to the North Atlantic world, but that phase of history is over. 
So when we talk about social inclusion, we mean all parts of the world. We also mean all parts of society, women as well as men. Thank you for the first pr women prime minister of this country and a great leader worldwide. So this is uh, absolutely exemplary. And I've been meeting uh, women cabinet ministers uh, for the last three days. So this is a, a proof positive of uh, a massive positive development of social inclusion. We need to make sure that in every society, all ethnic groups, religious groups, gender, uh, geographies have that possibility for material well-being and possibility for fulfillment. So that's the second pillar of sustainable development. And as we say in the UN, it means leave no one behind. Very simple. The third pillar of sustainable development, of course, is the environmental sustainability. And this is a fact of reality that is something new for our generation. We never by human beings themselves. Uh, human beings live through us ages, we live through major climate changes, but now the climate, the biodiversity, the ecosystems, the chemical dynamics in our air and water and soils are being determined largely by human beings and being shifted by human beings. So we call it the Anthropocene. Anthropos meaning people and seen meaning geologic age. This is the age of humans, not in the good sense, like, yay, we won, but oh, we're destroying the planet and we're doing it rather quickly and inadvertently. And based on carbon dioxide when they're burned, so pervasive and large that the human effect on every part of the Earth's physical systems is now profound and dangerous. And it's right to say that there are at least four dimensions of those dangers. One is the human-induced climate change, the second is the loss of biodiversity and ecosystem functions. The third is the massive chemical pollutants. And the fourth, ironically, is the new pathogens. And I'm of the view that actually that pathogen was actually out of a laboratory. So it's human created, not even in the accidental sense, of coming from disturbing nature, but probably from a laboratory experiment that went terribly awry. Now that's a controversial issue. I think my government's lying about this, but I'm gonna leave it there unless we wanna come back to uh, discussions. Uh, but I do think the US did a lot of dangerous experiments and unleashed a virus on the world that it doesn't want to admit that it unleashed on the world. The fourth pillar of sustainable development is perhaps the most elusive of all. It's SDGs 16 and 17. It is peace and cooperation. I don't know what's going on in the heads of world leaders, especially in the so-called Western world, but they somehow forgot about talking to their diplomacy and negotiation. Everything is about how can we escalate the armaments. President Macron saying, should we send troops to Ukraine? No, Mr. President, we don't want World War III. That's a terrible idea. What are they thinking?
working with. And by the way, since we're different, we have different views, different perspectives, the only way to do this is dialogue. That's our theme today, is a high-level policy dialogue. President Biden and President Putin have a dialogue. Every day I offer the White House my Zoom account if they want to make a Zoom call to President Putin. They can borrow my phone. But they don't do it. They just send weapons. They don't talk to each other. I talk to Russian They want to talk, by the way. And they want to negotiate. So this is the fourth pillar, economic prosperity, inclusion or social justice, environmental sustainability, and peace and cooperation. Wouldn't that be a nice world? We give applause to sustainable development. When those ideas were put down on paper, by a commission that Ban Ki-moon appointed. It had a lovely title, which I really like. It was, the commission report was called The Future We Want. What a nice title. That's what this is about. It's about human choices to make the future we want. Now, how do we choose? We have to choose with knowledge, wisdom, and rationality. That's where the National Planning Authority comes in. Because we have to understand what are the factors, what are the factors that can lead to economic well-being or not, what are the sources of prosperity, what are the challenges to social inclusion, how to address the environmental problems, nationally and scientifically observed, and then to understand what our policies are to bring that about. So when I started studying economics, and I'm going to give you a terrible admission, that was 52 years ago. And 51 years ago, a young woman professor uh, in her First year coming from Yale was my teacher in macroeconomics. She's now the U.S. Treasury Secretary, uh, Janet Yellen. But uh, we started back then, uh, a half century ago. When I started economics, the Nobel Prize that was given right at the beginning was to a professor, Jan Tinbergen, who was a, a great economist who had a simple idea uh, which was called targets and instruments. So his idea was you set your targets, you decide or you understand what instruments of policy you have to reach those targets. In his day, you inverted a matrix, and then you set your quantitative uh, levers in order to reach those specific targets. And he developed the mathematics of N targets and N instruments. The theory was that if you have N number of targets, you need N uh, instruments that are not multi-collinear. That's it. So they cannot be you know, perfectly uh, correlated in some way. And you need, if we have 17 goals, essentially we need 17 instruments. Actually, we have 159 targets, so we need at least 159 instruments. That's okay. That's uh, having clinics, that's having community health workers, that's having uh, teachers, that's having uh, digital. We've got lots and lots of instruments. And the main way to achieve sustainable development is to understand where we want to go in a qualitative and quantitative way, use our technical knowledge of engineers, of financial specialists, of economists, of political scientists to say, how can we actually get to where we want to go? And when we're not getting to where we want to go, why? 
what are the impediments? What is holding back the progress and make a rational analytical calculation? But also not to forget the dialogue because this is not only a calculation that has to be made in each of the 193 UN member states, each of which is committed to the sustainable development goals and principle that every country signed up to them, but also many of the goals can only be achieved. And in fact, for each country, many of the goals can only be achieved if there is cooperation among neighbors, and for many of the goals, only if there is cooperation at the global scale. And that requires a lot of dialogue. But the first thing for dialogue is put down the guns, keep the bombers on the uh, tarmac, and start talking rather than the fighting. Now, I know that there is enough finance for all of this because the United States is wasting about one and a half trillion dollars on the military this year. So that's a tremendous loss that could be devoted to sustainable development. And uh, Isaiah said it well, he was a very good economist, the prophet Isaiah in the eighth century BC, when he said uh, that we should uh, beat the, uh, uh, beat the uh, swords uh, into uh, plowshares and the spears into pruning hooks. Uh, and that was very good advice. That's just economic transformation. Uh, we should stop wasting our resources on the military and on the destruction and turn the resources to uh, economic development and human uh, betterment. And there would ample resources in the world to achieve every sustainable development goal if we just cut out most incredibly wasteful two and a half trillion dollars to three trillion dollars a year that are now being spent directly on military outlays alone. So why am I optimistic for Africa's development in this context? because we have some very powerful examples of what can be accomplished. And for me, a starting point I think is quite important, relevant, and interesting is that there are three regions of the world today that have 1.4 billion people. One is China, a second is India, and a third is the African Union. So these are three places of 1.4 billion people. China has been experiencing rapid economic development for more than 40 years now. It's a very good example of the path that Africa should follow. India has been experiencing rapid economic growth now for the last 20 years and especially for the last 10 years. It's following with a lag, I'd say about a 15 to 20 year lag, what China accomplished starting in the late 1970s and early 1980s. In my view, this is Africa's takeoff point now. From 2023 to 2063 is how I want to count it. And it's the same path. There is a difference though of China, India, and Africa, which is of course that when the uh, European imperialists divide up Africa, Berlin, oh so politely among themselves in 1885, uh, they carved up this continent into it's now 55 countries. China was brutally suppressed and India was colonized by one country, uh, and it stayed essentially as one country, although I, could, I think we could say it's three countries now, India, Pakistan, and, and uh, Bangladesh. But India remains a giant, China remains a giant, and Africa needs to become a giant uh, by unity among the five nations 
that will make everything that I'm about to describe a lot easier than it is right now. Africa has, I believe it is 15 landlocked countries, if I have the count correct. Landlocked countries like yours need uh, sea-based countries in their neighbors as good partners. And a continent like Africa needs basically unity so that we don't talk about landlocked or not landlocked. We talk about one large continental market that is dynamic and playing a major dynamic role in the world. Now, what did China do during the last, now basically 45 years since Deng Xiaoping came to power? China invested heavily in all critical areas of the economy. And it planned well and invested well. And the investment rates were typically above 40% of national income on a sustained basis for four decades. And that's not even counting all the investment because the way we count investment in the national income accounts is absolutely wrong we leave out the most important investment of all. We count in the national accounts education as consumption. Well, education is fun. We're consuming knowledge, but it is really investment. And we heard in your anthem, Makareri anthem, building for the future. That's the essence of what investment is. So we should count education spending as investment, not as consumption, so the national accountants don't have it right. And if you add that in, China's been investing more than 50% of its gross domestic product for the last 40 years. It's building for the future. And with such a high investment rate, it accomplished breakthroughs that are absolutely impressive and informative for Africa, because China grew in economic terms as conventionally measured by the gross domestic product at around 10% per year for 40 years. Unbelievable, by the way, but it's right there. And it's the result of a very high investment rate and a high saving rate that most of that investment most of the time. What did China invest in? What does any successful economy need to invest in? Four main types of capital. You know what? I'm going to classify them as five main types of capital because of where we are in one of our themes. The most important of all the investments, period, by far quantitatively, not morally, ethically, but quantitatively in contributing to growth is education. Nothing comes close to the value of education in terms of raising GDP per capita. So China made sure that every child was in school and starting from just a, a few years of schooling, China reached an average school uh, completion of at least 10 years for the entire population, but for younger children now 12 to 14 years on average. So a massive expansion of educational opportunity was the most fundamental transformation that China made. The second category of capital is infrastructure. China built tens of thousands of kilometers of highways, fast rail, power transmission lines, and fiber. The country transformed itself physically in 40 years to a completely interconnected national economy. By the way, China has thousands and thousands of kilometers of fast rail. 
the United States does not have one kilometer of fast rail. We talk about it a lot. Wouldn't it be nice? I sometimes take the train from New York to Washington, hoping I'm going to get there. And when I do get there, it's four and a half or five hours. And if I were on a Chinese fast rail, it would be about an hour. So China did that for thousands and thousands of kilometers. We were just in China, my wife and I, a couple of weeks ago, visiting Huawei, which is one of my favorite companies in the world because it's just so good at digital technologies. And I learned, which I hadn't realized, that China is now at 5.5G, not at 5G. I didn't know what it meant, but it means that when 5G transmission of data was introduced just four years ago, now the system is 10 times faster in terms of bits per second than it was 10 years ago. So this is all, uh, four years ago, excuse me, it was introduced in 2019. 5G, now they call it 5.5G. So the third category of investment is massive interconnected infrastructure. The fourth category of investment, which China is catching up on because it didn't pay too much attention at the beginning, is natural capital, protecting it. Because it's easy to do a lot of economic development in a highly environmentally destructive way. And of course, much of that can be irreversible if you destroy species and habitat. China was very dirty for the first 25 years of development. Now they're on a path of not only environmental cleanup, but also global leadership in the clean technologies in photovoltaics, wind turbines, uh, electric vehicles, and many other advanced zero emission technologies. And the fifth category of capital is what could be called intellectual capital <coughs> or science and technology capital. <coughs> you could put it under the rubric of education, but it's probably useful to keep what we call IP or intellectual property or patents or scientific technological knowledge as a fifth investment. Every government in the world, no matter how poor or rich, should be investing at least 1% of GDP in science and technology. Every country should have the equivalent of national laboratories and science and uh, technology funding from the government level. It used to be said by the quote West or the North Atlantic, leave that to us, focus on primary education. No, 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 no. Don't leave anything to anyone else. You're the only people in the world that can know about and care about your own ecology, for example. No one else is going to understand your agronomy, your ecology, your biodiversity, your physical geographical challenges, your climate adaptation challenges, but you. So invest heavily in that because you need that knowledge. And that's the fifth area of investment. If you follow that basic approach, high investment leading to, sorry, I skipped one area of capital, but it actually naturally comes after the others. And that's business capital. And the reason it comes after the others is if you have a well-educated population, if you have an innovation lab like we just walked through uh, just around the corner from here at uh, the university, if you have electrification and transport and digital access, if you have the natural capital base on which to build, business is going to pour in 
It's going to pour in for local entrepreneurs, and it's going to pour in from international investors as well. They don't know it yet, but Africa is going to be the fastest growing market in the world in the next 40 years. And investors are going to say, my God, I need to be part of that. That's the new frontier. That's the new place I can make money. And so they will come. But they won't come if there's no electricity, if the rail from Kampala to Mombasa isn't working, if 5G isn't adequate, and especially if they can't find highly trained staff, highly trained workers, people who are going to be leaders of the businesses, then it can never work. So I put the business capital as what we would say in economics as an endogenous factor. Train the population, make sure every child gets educated, make sure that there is the core infrastructure, electrification, digital access, fast rail, other transport, public transport. By the way, you've got a lot of traffic in this city. You have a lot of traffic jams. Who needs cars, by the way, in this age? We should have autonomous vehicles coming in. You jump in, you call them on your phone, you get in, you get your short ride. Who needs to own a car? I don't believe in it. I don't own a car. I never want a car again. It was just headaches. So we need public transport systems. We need to think about how to make modern transport when the cars will come to pick you up themselves, by the way. Calculate the right paths and get you there without all the congestion that one has right now. We don't really need single vehicle ownership in the 21st century. People will find other things to crave but we don't really need the individual cars in my view. Okay, I don't wanna to digress too much, but I do wanna say that if there are all of these basics in place, they're fundamentals, they're not basic, but they're fundamental. The human skills, well-educated young people, physical infrastructure, the uh, protection of the natural capital, the incubation labs like we just saw around the corner here, business capital will come. And it will come from domestic entrepreneurs and it will come from international investors as well. So my view is that Africa should aim for seven to 10% per year economic growth and aim to sustain that for the next 40 years. <clears throat> and that international partners, especially the UN system, but I also want the Bretton Woods who are part of the UN family, the IMF and the World Bank to get on the case and not to tell your esteemed finance ministers and the former finance minister here who uh, is a great leader Oh, you should settle for 3% or 4% growth. You need austerity. Uh, you need to be careful. Uh, you, need, you don't really need uh, electricity until 30 years from now. This is not the approach that the international system should take. The international system should take the view, oh my God, half the population still doesn't have electricity. How are we going to get that financed? How are we going to get that implemented? Oh my God, uh, only 10% of the kids are finishing upper secondary school? That's impossible. What kind of future could that ever lead to? If the kids aren't even finishing high school, what kind of future? Except a lot of poor people in the future. So what the international partner should be saying is, we have to make sure that Uganda or any other country can make all of the investments that it needs 
to get this done at a massive scale and not delayed for 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years. But that's what countries are hearing right now. Oh, be careful. Don't spend too much. Uh, be, you keep uh, everything very prudent. And the result is that there is not enough financing for any of those core areas for education, for infrastructure, for environmental protection, for science and technology. And then the businesses come around and say, well, why should I invest here? I can't even reach a port. I can't get my connectivity working. I can't find trained workers. It won't happen. And so this is really why we have to change the entire discourse of what we're doing and how we're doing it. So how do we get all of this financed? Because our topic is innovative financing and also the parish development model, and they go together in an important way. Why do they go together? Because what we need is a roadmap for high speed transformation, high intensity investment, and then a couple of particulars, how to actually carry out those investments because it's not good enough even if you had the money, if you don't have the pipes, the investments aren't actually going to take place. A lot of the money will leak as you know, and it will not deliver the actual investments and it won't deliver the growth. So we need both the financing access and we need the uh, ways to actually implement the investment. Let me start with the methods of implementation briefly first. The kinds of investments that are needed apply at the local level, let's say the parish or the sub-county level. They apply at the national level and they apply at the regional level. And I liked, I didn't realize that we would sing the anthem of the East African community starting off, but that made me feel good because that needs to be absolutely real, not just a name, not just an anthem, not just an office in Arusha. It needs to actually help to devise the transboundary infrastructure of East Africa. Fast rail, power transmission, 5.5G networks, protection of the forest regions and protection of the fisheries and the Great Lakes. All of this is a regional program, not just a national program. So when we think about the pipes, think about a parish development model, a national development model, an East African community development model, because they're all complementary. They're not competing with each other. Now, the parish development model is a, a big favorite of mine because, as you heard from the Minister of Local Government, uh, we've been very uh, keen, my colleagues and I and my esteemed colleague, David Sereri, can you stand up, David, who led the Millennium Village Project uh, in Ruhira and many, many important uh, programs in this country, have believed in the power of local investment. And you could call it the last mile or the last kilometer or the last 10 kilometers, but you need to make sure that in every parish, in every sub-county, there are good schools, there are good clinics, there is a referral center for health, there is physical connectivity for digital, there is transport, there are data connections, and you have a parish development model lab at Makareri. So I want to come back next year and hear your solutions. I'm talking to the students. The goal is to make sure that in every parish, 
the core investments, especially these vital services, education and health, and the vital infrastructure, electrification, safe water and sanitation, transport and digital are reaching everybody. And that means that in every parish you need data, you need monitoring systems, but put it all online so you can monitor it from your lab here in Makareri. You don't need any paper at all. Get everything digitized so that the good minister every day can look at his map on the screen and the red areas will show, no, the digital isn't working there today. The teacher's not where they're supposed to be. And the green areas will show everything, all systems are working. This is something that can be designed and implemented at the national level for the parish development model. And what a great project for you in Macarera. David Sereri and I offer our partnership to you uh, in every way so that we can make, make this practical effort work for the good minister so that he can minister to this whole country and it's more than 10,000 parishes. Now we need efforts at the national level for the road transport, for rail that's really working and high speed. I don't know the details of how things stand, but I know a lot more needs to be done. We need digital connectivity, and I know there's been a lot of progress, but there can be more progress, and you have Huawei and others here, MTN, Airtel, that are can be very good partners for national scaling up. And at the regional level, as I said, the transnational network for power, for transport, for digital. If that network were in place, this would be the hub for East Africa. Why not? You would be connected to the East and to the West. I heard it in the, in the song, in the anthem, to the North and to the South, you'd be a great hub. But you need those connections. And so that is, those are major projects that need financing. So let me turn to the last theme, which is where is the money going to come from? I don't know. But I'm going to help you look for it. That is what I've been doing for many, many years. And I believe that we can find it for a basic reason. The world is extremely rich today and the returns on long-term development in Uganda and in Africa are extremely high, not low, high. We're not talking about charity. We're not talking about aid. I tried to raise development aid for a long time because in my youth, I was naive. I believed in the goodwill of my government. I have grown up. I still believe that my government should have good behavior, though I don't believe in its goodwill so much. I believe it needs to be watched carefully. But I do believe that the finance in a world of $30 trillion of saving each year can flow to rapid economic growth in Africa the way that it has flown to rapid economic growth in China. Why not? It's the same principle. But the situation we have right now doesn't work. It doesn't work because Uganda is considered a super high risk country. So the risk premium that Uganda pays on its borrowing if it goes to the cattle market is punitive, maybe 12% interest, maybe 15% interest. 
Japan pays 1% interest. Germany pays 2% interest. The United States pays 4% interest. By the way, if we line up Uganda, the United States, Japan, Italy, France, Canada, who has the lowest debt to GDP? That would be Uganda. Not the highest, the lowest. Uganda's debt to GDP is 50%. The United States, it's 100%. In Japan, it's 255%. Japan pays 1% interest. Uganda pays, as I said, 12% interest. The credit rating agencies say you're not credit worthy. When I spoke to one of the leaders of Moody's last year about their whole design, they said, but Mr. Sachs, we don't know anything about development. We just predict default events. I said, you cause default events. Because you rate poor countries as risky, they pay high interest rates, and that leads to default. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You rate a country as risky, and therefore it borrows only short term. And then when the debt comes due, the development hasn't occurred yet. So it goes into default. As an example that I think is easy to understand, I want to finance all your children to be in school and for you to borrow if necessary to do so. But the borrowing needs to be on a 40 year maturity. Why? If you go to borrow on a seven year Euro bond to finance education, you will put a young child from pre-K to fifth grade, you will not yet have achieved the breakthrough to repay the loan. To repay an education finance loan requires 40 years. Get the kids through 15 to 20 years of school and let them have 10 to 15 years in the labor market. This will be a rich country. And then the debt can be paid off. So we have some work to do in the design of the international financing. I pressed the IMF six years ago that they had to change their approach, that they had to understand that they cannot tell countries, keep your budget balanced and stay in poverty. That is not an acceptable advice. That is their normal advice because they also don't do development, they do budget balance, which is different. So I asked the senior official at the IMF, how much does it take to educate a child in a low income country in Africa? He said, I don't know. I said, well, how much does it go? And I said, I said, you are the macroeconomic organization of the whole world. Don't you think you should know? Because that's what the finance ministers need to finance. And so they did their homework and they found out what I told them at the beginning, which was even if governments like Uganda's government does everything to mobilize domestic resources, the gap is still 15% of GDP. Even after all the cleanup of everything, the gap is large. And they discovered that. And they found that there's a financing gap of $500 billion. That was as of 2019 that they came up with that number. Now it's much bigger, maybe a trillion dollars a year needed to close the SDG financing gap for the developing countries, for even the most basic things. What did the IMF do about it? Nothing yet. They just realized there's a large financing gap. They admitted it in several excellent papers, but they haven't mobilized 
the money yet. But my view is, friends, what is a trillion dollars among friends? Not very much. It's 1% of world output. 1% of world output, we can't end poverty. Are you kidding? Spend $3 trillion on the military and we can't find $1 trillion for the developing countries? Of course we can. And my very excellent teacher of macroeconomics, Secretary of, of Treasury Janet Yellen, gave a speech a couple of years ago saying we need to move from billions to trillions in development finance. A wonderful speech. It hasn't happened yet, but she acknowledged very clearly the truth of what needs to be done. So I have to tell you on this crucial part, we're not home yet on this, but we're close because the world's leaders of the major economies, which is now the G21, as you know, it used to be the G20, but the African Union is now the 21st member of the G21 as of last year's summit. They know the truth and they are about 90% of the world economy and world saving. And this is top of the agenda right now. It really is top of the development agenda, I should say. War is always the top of the agenda, sad to say. But of the economics agenda, finance is now the top of the agenda. The G20 is faced every day with calls for long-term, low-interest financing for developing countries. The Climate Convention is faced every day with calls for long-term, low-interest development financing. So what I want to promise you, though I can't give you the final answer for that part of innovative financing, we're going to get it done. Uganda is going to show a strong DP4. It's going to show a very robust plan to achieve rapid growth over the next 40 years. It's going to show that that rapid growth easily repays any long-term low interest loans that are taken to achieve that. It's going to make the case that the parish development model proves the last mile in an ingenious way and that institutionally this country is poised for the breakthrough that we're talking about, both at the regional, national, and local level, and we're going to find the funds. Let me finally say the world is changing rapidly now, in my view, in a very good way as well. It is no longer the Western-led world. It is no longer the North Atlantic-led world. It is certainly no longer the U.S.-led world. We are in a multipolar world. And this is all to the good. And it's really for the first time in centuries that we can say this. China's rise, India's rise, Africa's unity, these are transformative historical changes that I think are of great significance and great promise for the 21st century. What it means in a very practical way for Uganda is you have lots of partners all over the world. Don't think only of the traditional partners, think of new partners. Think of China, think of India, think of Turkey, think of Brazil, think of other countries all over the world that want strong, robust, economic, political, and social relations with Uganda and with Africa. I know that they're there. I travel all over the world all the time. And you have lots of friends to reach out to, lots of potential partners, lots of investors. We're going to get this done. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Professor, for a wonderfully delivered um, presentation and very impactful, I'm very sure, for these young people, for this country. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I have an unenviable task to perform right now. Honorable Prime Minister is going to be leading Professor and the team um, to meet uh, His Excellency shortly after this. But Professor wants to hear from the uh, esteemed panel that was put up. Now, this is what we are going to do. Um, I'm going to invite the panel and one by one they will sit on the right hand of, the, of Professor Sachs. And from whatever time that we had given you, 20 minutes, 10 minutes, since you're all good teachers, we will give you three minutes each um, so that you can cut in. Um, Professor Suruma, I am very sorry, but work has to be done. Um, so let me start with inviting um, Ms. Anne Molindwa, Managing Director, Uganda Finance Trust Limited, to just give us her thoughts on the role of national financial institutions in accelerating SDGs. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together to welcome Anne. Um, we are also supposed to have the Honorable Matia Kasaija, I don't see him in, is, did he send a representative? If not, then that, okay. Um, we have Professor Ezra Suruma, former vice chancellor, Makere University, and senior presidential economic advisor on the role of academia in accelerating SDGs. A man who needs no introduction if you're talking about the economy, if you're talking about financial inclusion and all these kind of things. Professor, you're most welcome. Former minister uh, in charge of finance. You can take your seat. I will also invite Amina Nasali Sentongo, president of Uganda Youth Coalition for SDGs, representing our young people, the future, not just the future, but even the contemporary Uganda's uh, demographics. I mean, uh, you're most welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, it's only good manners if you put our hands together to welcome the speakers. The other speaker I will invite is Dr. Jonas Tegen Waldemarian the World Health Organization representative to Uganda on the role of development partners in influencing and accelerating SDGs. You're most welcome. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, usually I don't fear fire, but today allow me duck, and I will do that by inviting Professor Pamela Mbabazi to come and take the fire. I'm not going to take the fire from these illustrious speakers who are not happy with the time that I've cut for them. So I will invite Professor Pamela to come and manage them. Immediately they finish, we will have very fast closing remarks and then a photo opportunity just outside here where the banner is for the SDGs. But let's enjoy the discussion starting with welcoming Professor Pamela. You're most welcome, Chairperson of NPA. Let's put our hands together for her. Thank you very much, um, MC, for coordinating us well. The Right Honorable Prime Minister, our Honorable Minister, Raphael Maghezi, um, the Vice Chancellor, Macquarie University, our distinguished guest, Professor um, Sachs, the UN resident rep, Professor Suruma, um, my dear brother and friend in Christ, and our uh, former um, Chancellor of Macquarie University, and all distinguished panelists, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me really great pleasure to be here and to really coordinate 
the conversation. I want to begin by thanking Professor Sachs for that very elaborate uh, presentation. I think you have, you have restored some hope into us as Uganda. And I think that for me, as the chair of the planning authority, I think that we need to interrogate this further and understand. We have been told um, that it is possible to realize 7% growth and that we can do this if we are able to borrow money, borrow money that is low interest, borrow money that is over a long period of time and that we can implement for priorities that we have articulated very well by strategically planning and getting our targets right. So I'll begin with you, Professor Suruma. You've heard Professor Sachs speak. You've heard what he says will turn around this country. Even through the parish development model, the last mile that you rightly, rightly um, conceptualized. What are your thoughts? Can we get it? Is he dreaming? Can we do this? Give us your thoughts in three minutes. Thank you very much. Uh my sister Pamela, the right hand of our Prime Minister, with your permission. It's a pleasure to see you again. Um, or protocol observed. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sachs, for your address. I came with uh, many pens, expecting very complicated formulas. And I want to thank you for making a very, very clear and, and really understandable presentation so that all of us could follow what you are saying. Thank you very, very much. I enjoyed the address very much. I, 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 without uh, appearing to be too selfish, first of all, Professor Sachs, uh, we've been together when I was Minister of Finance, we had many meetings together. He used to come to my office and uh, we met also in, in New York and Washington and in Norway. I remember being with him in Norway and he gave us a great deal of advice. And I want to inform you, Professor Sachs, that during my time as Minister of Finance, the economy grew between 7% and 8.3%. In all of the four years that I was minister, and so that's why I, wa I was uh, awarded the best finance minister in Africa in 2008. So right honorable prime minister, I think you should recommend for me to be returned. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you for the optimistic uh, view that you've given us that the global uh, financial uh, landscape is changing, which indeed it is, so that we don't have to look to America alone for our financing. And uh, certainly I, I did have experience. Uh, my people know, our people know that I did not always agree with the Bretton Woods institutions. In fact, I disagreed rather violently. And I think that's why I was fired. Um, I did not always agree with the conditionalities, although the, the, laws, the laws were concessional, but the conditionalities were hard. And uh, so when you say that we have, we, we, we are not uh, tied to the Bretton Woods institutions and Western countries for our financing, I find that encouraging and hopeful that we can indeed look to a world that is more diversified 
in terms of sourcing uh, financial assistance and, uh, and loans. The second point I would like to make, I'll be very brief, uh, Madam Pamela, is that uh, at home here, uh, Honorable Rafaro Magezi indicated that we put one trillion already into the 10,594 parishes. Now, if I ask you, where is that trillion now? I suspect you can't find it. It has disappeared. But at least I hope you can find it. Now, that to me is capital, which our country is attempting to invest in our country from our own sources. And that capital, if it is to be capital, it means that it should be seen as investment which will grow and grow and grow. So every year when we put a trillion, we should find a trillion plus because we invested a trillion last year and so on. So, but do we have an institution that is capable of tracing where that money is going and making sure that indeed it is being invested. My fear, and this is a question for the PDM lab to look into as well, is that we must have institutions to manage these pillars, particularly the financial inclusion pillar, yeah. so that that money is treated as investment and not consumption. True, true. So that every successive year, yeah. the parish, mm -hmm. which had 100 million last year, has now another 100 million added, another 100 million added, mm -hmm. and this money is working in the parish and helping to build the infrastructure and the other things that Gen uh, Jeff, uh, Professor Sachs is talking about. True. And so my main humble request to all of us yeah. is development, if development is to mean anything, yeah. and particularly parish development, let it mean that we created institutions that we shall leave behind yeah. and that will show that indeed we were here and we left something behind. Correct. Not that we spent money because now we know prosperity for all, where is it? It's nowhere. No. Uh, there's, uh, there are so many other programs. Where are they? You can't see them. True. We need institutions that we shall leave behind that will have these investments as a permanent part of the, that would be my interpretation of sustainability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Suruma. You made a very brilliant point that we need to really strive as Ugandans. We, we have this model, Parker University, that has the parish development, I mean, the parish um, development model lab that is going to continuously interrogate, continuously investigate, continuously understand what is working, what is not working, how can we correct it? And in that way, we can build those institutions that we want that will make the parish development model work. We can't have the luxury as a country to get this model fail. And I want to appeal to our youth, particularly here at Macquarie University, take it upon yourselves to really find ways in which you can make a contribution to make sure the parish development model works. It's the last mile, it's the only thing we have to turn around our country, let it be all of to make it work. Madam, Miss Anne, you are heading an institution here in this country. 
you have been giving out loans that are really suffocating people. You've had, you've had what says financial access is critical. It needs to be long-term. We need to turn around. What can an institution like yours do to change the thinking and enable us get the funding we require to transform this country? Give us your remarks and reflections. Uh, thank you so much um, for the question that you pose. Uh, it's not right that we give money that suffocates people. Our intention is different. We are part of this move for sustainable development. And uh, if people don't access finance, you will not see development. So that is not right from where we look at things. Uh, as uh, financial institutions, we have embraced a parish development model. And we have been able to channel out money. But the question remains, where is this money? We did meet the committee of parliament and uh, we felt that as banks, we were used as a conduit to get money to the people. People are not banking. Some of these accounts are becoming inactive and they will soon be dormant. Think about our systems that are supporting all this data that is not adding value to us. Uh, what can we do? Is all lost? The answer is no. We need to be involved in the thinking process. Now, if we had been involved, we would have said, okay, if somebody gets 100,000, how do they get it withdrawn? How do we follow through to make sure that people continue utilizing this money bank and we, we monitor the accounts being active? It is true that this money may not meet the desired intent for which it was started. But we have a huge balance for those who have not received. We can still do better. From where we are looking at things is that people are yearning for funds to start businesses. They are looking for capital, but capital in this country is not cheap. Even the institutions that you're dealing with as banks, we get this money from the open market and it is priced highly. And we add a spread and lend to you. We are also crying out loud and saying how I wish we get connected to institutions that have affordable funds so that we can reach out to the masses with affordable loans, especially the women. I cannot live without talking about the women. Women need finances. Women need to be included in this game we are running with. But if they continue being left out because women have their own challenges and those have to be addressed by designated funds. Where these funds are affordable, they are accessible. We are innovative as financial institutions, but we see that the utilization of our platforms is also still lacking. Mm -hmm. So the issue is going forward, we want to work with the people to tell us what they need yeah. so that we don't sit on our own and design products that will not address your needs. Yeah. How about the technology? Yeah. Is yeah. the technology comfortable for everybody, especially the person at the lower end of the pyramid? Yeah. Those are some of the things that will accelerate the achievement of the SDGs. Yeah. Otherwise, sitting here and the people at that side, yeah. we may not solve the problem. True. So what we need to do is let us attract yeah. as that cheap capital, we yeah. call cheap capital affordable mm. for us to enjoy the services that we provide. For me, I believe yeah. the seven years seem to be many years they can be shortened if our way of executing our plans right. is better. It's yeah. how you do it. The okay. ideas are perfect. Right. The thinkers have done well. Yeah. Now it is the execution. How do we execute? How do we monitor? Mm. How do we follow through? How True. do we report? How do we hold people accountable? If mm. we set goals for ourselves and we fail, we yeah. are all failures. True. So for True. us yeah. as stakeholders in this <laughs> space, yeah. we want you people to hold us accountable. Awesome. Did the money come? Mm -hmm. Did you send it to the people? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that good enough? The answer is no. If the deposits don't keep coming back to us, Thank Brilliant. you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so very much. I'll leave the best for the last. So I'll jump on to Dr. Jonas. You're here and you've worked tirelessly 
to help in, in, in as World Health Organization, but also as a development partner here. And you've had that the thinking must change. We can't really make any leeway either from aid or any other source, but we must find ways in which we can get Ugandans to be healthy. We need productive, healthy Ugandans. Our population is growing at a fast rate. We need a health center in every village. What are your reflections? Uh, thank you. And first of all, uh, all the panelists and uh, Professor, uh, it's really uh, a privilege to be here all, also to listen to these thoughts. Uh, I see the, the world's view starting to change if we follow this. But at the same time, the realities concerns me. Uh, when we have only 4% of GDP of Uganda allocated for health, or even less, 2.6% for uh, education. And when you consider the population growth, these allocations are not sufficient. So we may need to look into a different way of generating funding. Uh, I, I'm asked initially to talk about what the UN and the development partners are going to, to bring in. Here, we, you, we are your partners. We, we, the very fact that we have the responsibility of convening member states convening partners and bringing them to agree, be it the Millennium Development Goal or the Sustainable Development Goal is important. But there are additional things we have to look into. Uganda puts close to 33% or even more, some of the economists will tell you, I'm the last one on this area, but uses its budget to pay the interest rate of our debt. When health is or the whole human development uh, budget is less than one third of the money we put for debt servicing. Here, all of us, the youth with your uh, networks, the NGO, civil societies, academics, we really have to ask is it a time where we should negotiate on our debts with the International Financial Institute or our bilateral loaners? Because the way, Professor, you clearly uh, indicated it, if we are going to pay debts from our budget, we are not going to go. Sugar uh, productions may bring us even better health outcomes at the same time making funding available for health. Let's see how we can improve efficiencies. Let's look into debt structuring. The, and also, let's see how we can benefit from climate financing. Yeah. But here, as development partners also, we know that about 50% of the, for example, health funding comes from the development partners. Oh. Can we live without it? No. But the very fact that our aid is decreasing is not going to help us. Help us with having more generation of external ODA, but let's put it in the right places so that we can be self-sufficient. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Yonas. And now our youth, the future of this country, a potential next prime minister of Uganda. What are your views? You've had Professor Sachs mention the need for education.